Well, I am, I am thrilled. I'm so honored to be here with you uh, today. Uh, my name is, as Dr. Barija pointed out, is uh, my name is Mandy Segel. Um, I am an associate professor of geriatric medicine at Florida Atlantic University's College of Medicine um, here in Boca Raton, Florida. So if you're keeping up with any of the uh, world news, uh, you may know that we recently had a midterm election here in the United States, and um, the county just below us, which is the county where I live in Florida, is the one that's uh, gumming up the works, so to speak. <laughs> and we don't really know what's going on, but um, we're, uh, it's an honor uh, to be here with you. What Dr. Barisha didn't tell you is that he was one of my fellows. Um, several years ago when I worked at the University of Cincinnati. Um, he and I worked very closely together and it's such a, an honor to be here today. Um, I direct the geriatrics curriculum thread here at our medical school and what that means is that we're really unique because in U.S. medical schools, we don't get a, generally speaking, uh, our students don't get a lot of content in geriatric medicine, and our medical school wanted to do things a little bit differently, um, especially because uh, the state of Florida has such a high percentage of older adults that live here. Um, so we have uh, meaningful content uh, integrated in all of our uh, curriculum here at uh, FAU. So every course has integrated geriatrics content within it throughout the four years of medical school, which is, is a real gift, I think, um, for our students. And, and it's just a delight for me to be able um, to teach them. So what I'd love to share with you today is a talk on geriatric screening and assessment, which I love to call, lovingly call, the geriatric review of systems. Um, I have to give thanks to Dr. Joseph Auslander, who is my boss and also an internationally renowned geriatrician um, for help with putting together some of these slides. Um, and like Dr. Barija said, some of this is very US centric um, and I will try to make it um, as applicable to what you're doing um, where you are, but you're gonna have to help me because I don't know how you practice there and I don't know the demographics of your population. So we'll have to work together to make this clinically relevant. Um, but I think most of it, uh, for the majority of it will be. So here we go. Um, I don't have anything to disclose. Um, and now for objectives, you know, I, I really want to spend some time describing the importance of geriatric screening and assessment and how it complements the standard history and physical that you're taught to take in medical school. Um, you know, I think that geriatric screening and assessment, the questions that I'm going to introduce to you in a little bit are, is relevant to any um, population of people uh, or patients if they have um, chronic complex illness, you know, multiple comorbid illnesses, these questions are important um, because we don't, we use these questions so that we don't miss things um, in folks. These are just, a, it's a really lovely way to be efficient about the way that you ask questions um, of older people or people who have chronic complex disease. And then we're going to talk a little bit about functional status and review some uh, screening questions. And so these are validated screening questions and validated assessment tools that we put together um, and then um, have actually had published recently. So all very exciting things. Um, they asked me to put together this slide for you on subtopics. So um, we're going to talk about the principles of geriatric medicine and introduce you to a case vignette that will thread throughout uh, this talk. Talk a bit about comprehensive geriatric assessment and what that means. Then delve into our geriatric review of systems so that more efficient framework to be able to take the, the concept of, of a comprehensive geriatric assessment and be able to apply it um, to an actual patient during a shorter uh, visit. It, um, and then sum things up and, and ask for some questions. So here at FAU, um, we teach around these Big Ten principles in geriatrics, and I wanted to put them up to share with you um, as well. So the first one, and I'm terribly fond of saying this, is aging is not a disease. Okay, so age in and of itself isn't a disease. And what does that mean? So many of my patients here in the US say to me that they go to see their physician, primary care or any subspecialist, and will come in with a, a significant concern to them. And often their physicians blow them off and just say, it's just because you're older. Well, that's not necessarily the case. The patients feel dismissed and feel as though their concern hasn't been adequately addressed. So 
age in and of itself is not a disease. Medical conditions in geriatric patients are commonly chronic, multiple, and multifactorial. That just makes sense. So often there's more than one reason for something to be going on with an older person or again, a younger person who has chronic complex disease. So more than one chronic illness. Uh, reversible and treatable conditions are often underdiagnosed and undertreated in geriatric patients. And that's very true because we don't go looking for them. And these, uh, the screening and assessment uh, tools, the screening questions and the assessment tools that I'm going to share with you uh, really help us hone in on those things that are often underdiagnosed and undertreated. Functional ability and quality of life are critical outcomes in the geriatric population. And I think, again, that's everyone, right? And what function means to one person may be different to another. And the same thing goes for quality of life. What someone believes is a, is a good quality of life may be very different to another person. Social history, living circumstances, and social support are essential aspects of management of geriatric patients. You know, we, we need our, our village, our team to help our patients uh, be functional members of society. And so often they rely on a caregiver at home or a, a health aide to come in to their home to assist, or children even, to assist with their care. Geriatric care then is multidisciplinary and interprofessional. You know, again, that's the team that here in the U.S. specifically, and I'm sure there too, we rely a lot on other health professionals for their expertise, whether it's a pharmacist or a physical therapist or a nurse um, or a social worker. We rely on their, um, their expertise to help us give, deliver the best care to our patients. Cognitive and affective disorders are very prevalent um, and commonly undiagnosed at early stages. And so again, those screening questions will really get at that um, to make sure that we're picking up on things sooner rather than later. Iatrogenic illnesses are common and many are preventable if we're looking for them. Um, so we have to be aware. And again, our, that's where our screening questions come in. Geriatric care is provided in a variety of settings, ranging from the home to long-term care institutions. Now, this may be different there. Um, I'm not sure how long-term care is delivered where you are, but here it's, it's uh, in an institution called a nursing home. So patients who are unable to do certain activities of what we call activities of daily living, so the basic things to keep them at home safely, often then are placed in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, which, where, which is where they'll receive 24-7 uh, care. And then last, ethical issues in end-of-life care are critical aspects of the practice of geriatrics. And I think, again, that's important throughout uh, medicine, being able to have a meaningful conversation with your patients about how they wish for their story of their life to play out is, is critically important. Um, okay, so I wanted to present to you um, a typical case that we would see here in the U.S. This is loosely based off of one of my patients. Um, a gentleman, uh, the names have ch been changed. Um, Mr. Caldwell is um, a gentleman who is 86 years old. I think I've missed a slide. There you go. You're in your clinic, um, and the nurse tells you that you have a new patient, Mr. Caldwell. He's 86 years old, and he moved to this area three months ago. Um, his daughter gave the nurse some background information. Uh, he recently moved to New York to be closer to his daughter after his wife died six months ago. He lives alone in a senior apartment building, but his daughter has noticed that he's missing meals. He's not as well dressed and groomed as he had been, and he's become less socially active. So I don't know if this happens where you are, but it happens all the time where I am, that patients will come with their family members to our visits, and the daughter or the son um, or the caregiver will pull you aside before you go in to see the patient and hand you some information or want to tell you very quickly what they're worried about before you go in to see the patient. And so you have to very quickly be able to filter and triage that information um, and use it adeptly in the room uh, with patients. So Mr. Caldwell's medical history is significant for arthritis, diabetes, and hypertension. And his daughter really wants to know how to best take care of her dad. What are your recommendations to help her best take care of her dad? Or, in, you know, it could be her mom, but in this case, it's her dad. And so you've got 30 minutes for an initial evaluation. So how do you proceed? 
Um, and here, really the answer to this question is almost always performing a history and physical exam, right? So again, as we start to introduce this concept of geriatric screening and assessment, we still have to do a history and physical exam. Um, that's always the right answer on any, uh, you know, test that you take if they give you a patient vignette and they ask you what's the first thing that you should do and history and physical exam is one of the answer choices that's the one that you absolutely should pick talking to the patient is critical in older adults however there are oftentimes some unique aspects to that physical exam um, this isn't every older adult but it's not it's it's many of them and so to point them out is just to make you aware to be on the lookout for these types of things because if we're not looking for them we may not find them so for older adults vital signs as people get older their arteries get more calcific um, so they may have an elevated systolic blood pressure or they may have postural changes in their blood pressure when they go from sitting to standing or uh or or laying flat to sitting, they may have drops in their blood pressure. They may have an irregular pulse. Atrial fibrillation is more common as we get older. They may have multiple lesions on their skin, including skin cancers that you have to look for. Um, squamous cell and basal cell carcinomas are very um, prevalent in older people. They may have diminished hearing and diminished vision. They may have systolic murmurs. Aortic stenosis is a very common murmur in older people. Diminished distal pulses, again, because of those calcific arteries and peripheral arterial disease. In terms of genitourinary issues, um, they may have vaginal atrophy, pelvic prolapse, um, you know, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Um, in the extremities, joint deformities, limited range of motion, uh, joint, uh, lower extremity edema. Neurological issues include muscle weakness, diminished reflexes, abnormal gait, and memory loss. And also, you know, geriatric assessment, assessment can be challenging. Um, there are many barriers to communication that we face, whether it's, you know, the person can't hear you or they can't see you, um, or they're scared to be in your office. Um, they may have dementia or delirium and you ha have to figure that out um, while they're there. That may make the encounter with them challenging. And then from a cultural perspective, there may, may be some cultural issues um, that you have to address, whether it's, you know, differences in language, they've had a bad experience coming to the doctor in the past, or they may have some spiritual belief that may prevent them from coming to the doctor or wanting to follow through with the treatment recommendations uh, that you put forward. And so often patients, because of a result of these challenging things, can be perceived as non-compliant. I don't know if you use this word um, where you are, but often it gets used here in the United States. And when residents and medical students and even practicing physicians use this word, I get really upset. Um, I'm very guilty of using this and you know, in my early in my career. And, and as I've seen more patients, I've been in practice now for about 15 years, as I've seen more patients, I, I've recognized that there's a reason for that noncompliance. And it's my job to, to figure out the why of that. If I'm starting to think, you know, Mr. Jones or Mr. Caldwell in this case hasn't been, isn't telling, is telling me he's not taking his medicine. I shouldn't call him non-compliant. I should find out why he's not taking his medicine. Does it not, does it make him not feel good? Can he not afford it? If he tells me that he hasn't gone to his next appointment to get a, a, this lab test done or to see a, a different specialist, why? Why is that? So if you're, if you're thinking about labeling somebody non-compliant or if somebody's not falling in line with what you want them to do in your recommended treatment plan, I think it's really important for you to, um, and I want to encourage you to dig a little deeper and to ask more questions and to ask why um, that is. Hearing impairment is huge in older people. Um, presbycusis is the doctor word for hearing loss associated with aging, specifically uh, loss of high frequency hearing. About 75% of people over the age of 80 have hearing loss. And when folks have unrecognized hearing impairment, so often it may make physicians or healthcare professionals think that they have some form of cognitive impairment. Um, hearing aids are very effective here in the United States, though. Insurance doesn't pay for them. A good pair of hearing aids in the United States costs about $4,000, so that can be incredibly cost prohibitive. Um, 
for women in the audience, you know, female physicians specifically in terms of presbycusis being a loss of high frequency hearing, we really have to drop our voices down an octave to talk to patients because our voices and our register of our voices is here and we have to drop our voice down here. We all of us have to learn to talk slower, but without being patronizing. And I'm very guilty of talking very rapidly, but if you see me talk to patients, I talk at this pace. Not so slow that they think that I'm making fun of them or just being disrespectful, but slow enough that they're able to hear me. Um, and there are ways to overcome these communication barriers, uh, you know, making sure that your room is well lit, um, eliminating extraneous noise. I know at least here in the US hospitals are so very noisy, so that one's very difficult to do sometimes. Facing the patient directly face to face. And again, speaking slowly in a, in a, in a lower octave tone is incredibly helpful. If the patient does have a hearing aid, use it. Um, this right here is the picture there is what we call a pocket talker. I have one that I carry around with me. Um, these are available in the US for about $20. Um, it's a portable amplification device. So you can see here, there are headphones that you put on the patient and then you talk into this little speaker box and it amplifies the sound um, for the patient. Um, you know, men in the audience, it's really important that if you have facial hair that you keep it uh, groomed um, well because so very often at the very beginnings of people having hearing loss, they start to read lips. And if they can't see your lips, then so very often they can't hear you. And it almost becomes involuntary for them. They don't even know that they're doing it, but they rely very much on uh, reading your lips. If you encounter a patient that, um, you know, just keeps going, uh-huh, yes, and is agreeing with you, is incredibly agreeable with you, they may not be hearing you. They just may be agreeing with you. Um, the other really cool thing, if you don't have access to a, a pocket amplifier, is that each of you, I believe, has a stethoscope, right? Yes, nod your head. Yeah, okay. So a stethoscope is an amplification device, right? So if you have a patient who has hearing loss, what you can do is you can put your ears of your stethoscope into theirs. And by doing so, then you talk through the bell in just a regular tone of voice. And when you do that, it will amplify the sound. Do you guys have stethoscopes in the room with you now? So try it on your partners. Take two seconds and try it. So this is the coolest trick that geriatricians have. We call this the reverse stethoscope technique. Did you hear it? Yeah, wasn't that cool? That was cool? So cool, right? Yeah, I know. I always look like a rock star when I introduce patients to when I introduce students to this. So I'll tell you a story. We were rounding in the hospital, and I just heard this cacophony of um, noise in the hospital. This man was screaming at this nurse, and this nurse was screaming back at this man. And I went in there just to make sure everybody was okay. And I quickly realized um, through my powers of observation that he couldn't hear her. And so I whipped out my stethoscope and I, I asked him, of course, and I put it in his ears and I just started talking in a normal tone of voice. And he was like, you could just tell, right? That he just got relaxed. He was like, I'm trying to tell her that I do not have my hearing aids. And, you know, I taught her that technique. So I, I encourage you to just take it with you as far and use it on your patients. It's really cool. Um, the other question that you often want to ask your patients is, do you have an ear that you hear best out of? Because when you ask them that question, if they hear better out of this ear, then you need to face that ear and talk to them in that ear. The other thing that we really like to do, this is my favorite, one of my favorite parts of, of comprehensive geriatric assessment is the brown bag technique of reviewing medications. I have our patients 
when I meet them for the first time, bring in all of their medicines um, to the visit, even the ones that a lot of times in the United States, people like to keep old and expired medicines. I'm not really sure why, but people do. And so we bring them all in and we kind of try to clean up that bag of medicines. We, why do we call it a brown bag, bag technique? Because people often will bring all of their medicines in a brown bag. Um, so when you're doing that, you're asking folks for the diagnosis for each medication. You're trying to understand if they're actually taking them and reviewing with them any potential adverse effects. Why is that important? Because there's this thing called the prescribing cascade. Well, what is that? It's when you're, you give a patient one medicine and they have a side effect from it, but instead of figuring out, hey, this particular side effect is due to that medicine, you give them another medicine to treat the side effect. All right, so a calcium channel blocker, for example, if you give somebody a calcium channel blocker for hypertension, one of their side effects is constipation. So the patient comes in to see you and then says, you know, I'm constipated. And then you give them a medicine to help treat their constipation. Well, if you had thought, you know, I know I'm a smart person. I, I know that this calcium channel blocker can cause constipation. Then you may have saved them from having to take another pill. So very often, and I'm very guilty of this too, although I try really hard not to be, is we ask our patients, you know, are you taking your medicines or are you doing this? And they're going to tell you, yes, yes I am, because they don't wanna be ashamed to tell you that they're not. Um, and so a better way to ask that, oops, a better way to ask that question is, how many doses of your medication have you missed? That then reframes the question and leaves it open to them to be more truthful to you, to tell you that they've actually missed their medicines. Um, you know, I, and that then helps you not add more medicines to their list, but to try to really then inquire, well, well why? And help them with developing a strategy to remember to take their medications. So again, here we are at Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment, which again, like I mentioned earlier, really enhances the standard history in physical and older patients. In geriatrics, we like to call this our gyroscope because it's a real picture into what's going on uh, with patients. Gyroscopes aren't real, we've coined that word, um, but it, it feels, you know, geriatrics, we don't have a ton of procedures, we don't put, we don't stick things in people, um, but what we do do is we listen, we listen to people. Um, and we really hear what they have to say. Um, the goals of comprehensive geriatric assessment are really to help, to, to help us understand our patients, you know, the goals, values, and beliefs, what their preferences for treatment are, what their most important concerns are, understanding their adherence to different treatments, and any barriers there and any in, in their chronic health conditions. It helps us to identify undiagnosed and potentially treatable conditions, helps us to evaluate function, social circumstances, and support in their overall quality of life. And most importantly, it helps us to recognize high risk situ situations, safety situations, and intervene before they become more dangerous. It really focuses on what we like to call the biopsychosocial model. So instead of saying there's this patient in room one who has chest pain, saying it's Mrs. Jones in room one who has chest pain, her daughter lives out of town, and she's very nervous about what this may mean for her because you've really talked to her both about not only her physical diagnosis, also her psychological needs and her socioeconomic um, needs. So putting that all together then is what in the U.S. and I'm sure worldwide is starting to be called person-centered care. So really focusing on the person, not the disease. Sir William Osler, who is one of the, the fathers of medicine in the United States or globally, said, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient. The American Geriatric Society is the American uh, uh, group of geriatricians that gathers together um, every year. It's a or large organization here in the United States, and they really believe in this concept of person-centered care, treat the person, not the patient. So one part, like I told you, we talk about of geriatric assessment that's so critical is function. 
is this person independent and being able to do the things that they need to do to get through their day? Or do they need assistance with routine things? Or are they completely dependent on somebody else to accomplish the things that they need to accomplish? So activities of daily living or ADLs include things like eating, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing and grooming, maintaining continence, and they're hierarchical, which means that you learn how to eat before you learn how to walk. You learn how to toilet before you can bathe yourself and put your clothes on and then maintain continence. Um, these are things that there's a, a mnemonic for these that I'm so bad at remembering mnemonics. Um, but I think of this conceptually as things that little children have to be able to do to be able to go to kindergarten or to primary school. Um, and so as we're thinking about this, if we're thinking about older adults maybe needing some assistance here, can you think of what the best question might be for ADL impairment and which ADL is usually impaired first? Can you think, do you think it's, if, raise your hand, do you think it's eating that's impaired first? What about transferring? Toileting? Bathing? Okay. Who thinks it's bathing? Anybody? Nobody wants to vote. Relaxing. Okay. Dressing and grooming or maintaining continence? What do you think? What? Maintaining continence. Okay, continence. Actually, it's bathing. Let me come out of here. It's bathing. So the question then that you ask is to screen for ADL impairment is do you have an issue taking a shower or bathing? And if people say yes, then you need to do a little bit more digging and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Instrumental activities of daily living then are things like shopping, cooking, cleaning, using the telephone, managing medications, managing finances, transportation and driving, and any more now, use, use of technology. You know, a lot of older people are on email and texting. Um, doctor's offices here in the United States send text messages to remind us to come to our appointments. Um, so the questions that we should use to screen for IADL impairment um, I want to think, I want to, before I tell you the answer, I want to ask you, which of these IADLs do you think are usually impaired first? You know? Cleaning. What's that? Managing medications. <laughs> I can't. Managing medications. Managing medications. Well, here, it's, it's usually driving and managing finances. Um, in terms of IDLs that are, are, are that go away first. And so the screening question there is, are you still driving? Do you have trouble managing your finances? These IADLs are instrumental activities of daily living. I like to think of conceptually as things that you have to be able to do to live independently. So often we take these things for granted until we can't do them or we need assistance doing them. And again here, right, asking about ADLs and asking about IADLs is important not only to ask in, in older people, but it's important to ask in younger people if they've been hospitalized or if they're going in for surgery or coming out of surgery, what are the things that they may not be able to do that they may need assistance with post-operatively? So being able to address that ahead of time may help you uh, before you discharge them or before they go home, you can provide them with the assistance that they're gonna to need to be able to make a successful transition back to home. Uh, so, you know, driving may be the first function to go. Where I live here in South Florida, we have a high concentration of older drivers. Um, this first picture with the two older people on the scooters there in front of the, that's a gas station. Um, I, I took off the internet. The other picture that you see there with the older woman on the scooter and the children on the bicycles, that's um, from my friends. That's my friend's grandmother and her three children um, going down a trail and they're all kind of driving, but in different ways. I just thought it was a really cute picture to share. Social history is also part of geriatric assessment and it's my most favorite portion of the history because it really is a story into that person's life. It really helps your patients 
feel as though you are seeing them as a, as a person rather than the disease, and it's absolutely essential for person-centered care, you can pick up clues about family dynamics and depression and cognitive impairment if you listen carefully to what your patients are saying to you. I'd like to read this to you. This is a essay um, on the importance of social history. It's written by a friend of mine who is a family medicine physician at Penn State, um, Dan Woolpaw and his friend, Dan Shapiro. Um, it, this was an essay published in the New England Journal of Medicine in April of 2014. Um, so let me read it to you. It says, interesting belt, where did you get that? I see you are from Youngstown. That's a town in Ohio. The key question is, are you a Steelers fan or a Browns fan? Those are two football teams in the United States. These are not the usual opening questions we teach for the medical interview. The answers are not included in the chief complaint, history of present illness, past history, social history, family history, review of systems, medications, or allergies. There's no hat or belt section in the physical exam. Differential diagnoses on sports, clothing, or food preferences are not a highly valued component of clinical reasoning. But often these opening comments and questions are the most important. They can be our tickets and our guides, ways to establish the connections that allow us to actually care for the person in front of us. So they're not irrelevant, right? They're important. And I often lead with the social history. Um, when I take a history from patients, I used to get in trouble when I was in residency because I would present the social history first as you know, integrated into my history of present illness. But my attendings um, finally saw the value in that because I was always the resident who knew who had children that might be considered troublemakers, if you will, or who had issues that they needed to take care of at home before they could consent for something of uh, some procedure that we wanted to do. So asking those social history questions is so valuable. And it's not just alcohol intake, smoking and illicit drug use. It is so much more than that. A complete social history is asking where somebody has been born, um, their education history. So we ask that question, how far did you go in school? Work history, I asked that question, um, what was your longest form of employment? leisure time activities or hobbies, I ask that question by asking people, what do you do during the day? What is their living situation? Who do they live with? Family and other relationships. Do they have children? Uh, do they like their children? Do their children like each other? All of these are really important. Are they a caregiver or do they have caregiving responsibilities for someone else? What are their sources of income in the United States? Of course, insurance becomes very important in terms of how we can access assistance for our patients. Advanced care planning, having that conversation with somebody before they get into a crisis situation is critical. And spirituality, you know, here in the US, we don't do enough talking about spirituality with our patients. And there's study after study that shows us that um, at least here in the US that our patients really want us to talk to them about that. And I can't imagine that it's not similar where you are, that patients really want us to talk to them about their faith and their beliefs and how that relates back to the care that they're, they're wanting for themselves. Um, we just don't do a good job of doing that. I think it makes us feel uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with the information. Um, and I think maybe some of us don't wanna feel disrespectful, but I think it's really important in the way that I ask that question is, do you have a, you know, certain faith beliefs that may impact um, your care, the care that you wanna receive or the treatments that you wanna receive? So then geriatric assessment, obtaining information here, you get verbal report from the patient is really critical, but also verbal report from the family and other caregivers and direct observation and examination, right? What you see and what you do. While you can trust what somebody else has done before you, always trust, but verify your own information. Take your own history, do your own physical exam, and you'll be surprised that sometimes you may find out different things. We have to be detectives, right? So the geriatric review of systems really uses standard screening tools, or sorry, standard screening questions and geriatric assessment tools. The screening questions are validated and may identify geriatric conditions that may not be recognized. And these are things that we don't wanna miss. If we have positive screening questions that will then trigger further evaluation by using standard geriatric assessment tools, which I'm gonna share with you. All right, so in looking at this handout, um, we have just recently published this. This is recommendations for geriatric screening and assessment. And you can see in that top 
horizontal red box that you have geriatric assessment domains, screening questions, and further geriatric assessment for positive responses to the screening questions. And then down um, in the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see two of the domains, social and functional. And then if we move over here to the second half of that sheet, there are two other domains, geriatric syndromes, cognition, and affect. And we're gonna go through these um, uh, in the next few slides. So remember Mr. Caldwell, who's our 86-year-old patient who recently moved from New York to be closer to his daughter after his wife died six months ago. His medical history is significant for arthritis, diabetes, and hypertension. He lives alone in a senior apartment building. His daughter has noticed that he's missing meals, not as well dressed and groomed as he had been, and becoming less active socially. So let's try to apply then to his situation our recommendations for geriatric screening and assessment. So if we think about Mr. Caldwell and we look at this particular screen here, again, we've got our geriatric domains um, in that first column on the left and our screening questions, which are validated screening questions in the middle, and then further geriatric assessment um, on the rightmost column. We only do these assessments if we have a positive screen to one of these screening questions. The idea here is that it tries to be, what we're trying to do is create a framework so we can give you a more efficient way to take care of an older person and or a person that has chronic complex illness. So in that social domain, we've got things like social support, alcohol abuse, elder abuse, advanced directives. In the functional domain, we have functional status, driving, vision, and hearing. So while all of these questions are important, we really do have to adapt our screening questions to the patient that's sitting in front of us or that's in the room with us. Um, and so I'd like to think about which ones of these screening questions might be the most important to ask to Mr. Caldwell today, recognizing that you can bring him back and you should bring him back to see you to ask the rest of the questions unless you just have unlimited time, in which case you can do all of the screening questions, and then for whichever ones are answered in the affirmative, do the subsequent uh, assessment tests. So again, thinking about Mr. Caldwell and his situation, he's 86 years old, he has arthritis, diabetes, and hypertension. He's living alone and doing a little less than he used to. Functional status is the thing that I consider the most important out of this whole sheet of domains. So the screening questions there then are, do you need assistance with shopping or finances? If that's answered in the affirmative, then that would uh, indicate that you need to do further assessment into his instrumental activities of daily living. And if he answers in the affirmative to the screening question of, do you need assistance with bathing or taking a shower, then you would prompt, that would prompt you to do a basic ADL assessment. On this side here, um, if you look at geriatric syndromes, that domain is made up of things like polypharmacy, fall risk, incontinence, weight loss, sleep disturbance, and pain. And then you look at cognition and affect, depression, and cognitive impairment. And again, while all of these are important, um, thinking about the person, Mr. Caldwell, who's in your room with you, who's sitting with you, who's your patient today, which ones of these are going to be the most important for him? And so that would be polypharmacy fall risk, depression, and cognitive impairment. So in terms of polypharmacy, you can ask him, do you take five or more routine medications, excluding vitamins or other supplements? And do you understand the reason for each of your medications? If he answers in the affirmative to five or more medications or answers no, that he doesn't understand the reasons for each of his medications, then you can do some education. You can do medicine reconciliation, which is that brown bag review, making sure that you, you understand why your patient is on each of the medications that they're on. What is the indication? If you don't know what the indication is for a certain medication, then that person may likely not need to be on that medication, or you need to do a little bit more digging to figure out why they are taking that medicine. Always consider reducing doses, stopping medications, uh, trying strategies with adherence aids. So like pill minders in the US, we have these little plastic boxes that are labeled with the days of the week and people put their pills in them and then open them up every day to take their pills is one strategy. Um, or you can consult a pharmacist to get to, for their expertise here. Mr. Caldwell is a fall risk. So the screening questions for falls are, have you fallen in the past year? Are you afraid of falling? 
Do you have trouble climbing the stairs? Do you have trouble getting up from a chair? Um, and then if that is answered, any of those are answered in the affirmative, then you want to do the get up and go test, which I'm gonna show you in just a few minutes. Um, consider doing a full falls assessment. Consider uh, sending him to physical therapy or a home safety assessment. Here in the US, the way a home safety assessment is done is that we write for it on a prescription pad and then uh, a physical therapist and an occupational therapist go to our patients' homes and assess them for risks, um, safety risks. So those are the false questions. Interestingly, fall should be asked about at every single visit in patients that are older and in patients who have chronic complex illness. Why? Because people aren't going to tell you that they've fallen because they're going to be worried that you're going to take away their independence. Um, when you see somebody in follow-up, the question is, have you fallen since the last time you've seen me? Now, while the validated screening question is, have you fallen in the past year, it's important to note that a lot of people can't remember over the past year. I know I can't for certain. So maybe a better screening question then to consider is, have you fallen in the last six months? If you're seeing patients in the hospital, you need to ask the question, have you fallen since I last saw you yesterday? Or have you fallen in the last day? And then if we move on down to depression, the screening questions there are, do you often feel sad or depressed? Have you lost pleasure in doing things over the past few months? If those are answered in the affirmative, then you want to perform what's called the PHQ-9 or Patient Health Questionnaire 9, because it has nine questions on it, or the Geriatric Depression Scale. You absolutely must screen these patients for suicide risk, the demographic with the highest um, incidence of completed suicides is the older population and consider sending them to a psychologist or for a psychiatric evaluation. Um, that's what we would do here in the US. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, how mental health is dealt with where you are. Um, in terms of cognitive impairment, the question there is do you or any of your family or friends think you have a problem with your memory? If your patient is hospitalized, you need to make sure that you rule out delirium, and that's with using the confusion assessment method test, which I'd be happy to come back and discuss with you guys. Um, it's available in the public domain. Um, if they say yes to that question, or if you're worried about them having cognitive impairment, then do the mini cog, which is a three item recall and a clock draw, which I'll show you in just a minute. If they fail that test, then you want to do further assessment with either the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is available for free um, online, and it's available in 55 different languages, and I'll show you that. Um, the slums, which is the St. Louis University Mental Status Test, or the Mini Mental State Exam, which I point out here just because we're doing an academic talk, but in, here in the U.S., we don't use this test as much because it's proprietary. If you are unclear about the diagnosis of cognitive impairment, here in the U.S., we would send somebody to see a neuropsychologist for further testing and review. So if we think about functional status, right, the screening questions are there in the center. Let's go over those assessments then. For instrumental ADL assessment, we use something called, oh, sorry, for ADL assessment, we use something called the CAT scale um, of independence and activities of daily living. You can see the activities of daily living are there in that left-hand column, and that people often fall in between independence and dependency, or sorry, fall or either solidly independent or solidly dependent in these activities. Sometimes people will fall in the middle there. Um, the ways that you ask this question are simply around the ways that these activities are done. So do you have trouble getting in and out of the shower yourself or the bathtub? Are you able to put your clothes on, to pick your clothes out, to brush your teeth, to brush your hair? Are you able to get up and off of the toilet by yourself and keep yourself uh, clean? Um, are you able to get up and off of the chair for transferring it or up and out of your bed without issues? Do you have issues with continence? Um, do you have trouble with any fecal incontinence or urinary incontinence? Have you ever wet yourself? Do you wear adult diapers or pads? For feeding, asking them if they have issues with eating. And often the way that I bring this whole conversation up with patients is by saying something like, I'm going to ask you some silly questions about things that I, that I, that you do all day long and then go into these questions about bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring continents and feeding. Sometimes we make assumptions that people are able to do things and when we ask these questions we uncover things that we didn't even know um, were there, which again is the reason that we're doing this. 
In terms of instrumental activities of daily living, these again are things that you have to be able to do um, to live independently. This particular assessment tool is validated as was the other one. It's in the literature. This is the Lawton scale. Um, and you can see here that the activities are listed there in the middle column. And then there's an I, which means independent, A meaning assistance, or D dependent. Now again here, people are either solidly independent, meaning they can do these things all by themselves, or they're solidly dependent, meaning they are absolutely dependent on somebody else doing this for them. But a lot of people, the majority of people, are fall in that needing assistance category, and they may lean, you know, more towards I need assistance, but I'm almost fully independent, or lean towards I need assistance and I'm going towards dependence. So asking these questions and even with the ADL questions, you definitely want to make sure that you're validating these with an informant or a caregiver because so often our patients have little insight into into what they're not able to do because someone's always helping them do it and again they're fearful to lose their independence so they may not fully disclose so confirming these things or getting collaborative history um, is critical here so the next thing then is that we're worried about with Mr. Uh, uh, Caldwell in terms of assessments that we can do. We talked about polypharmacy and those assessments earlier, but now is fall risk, right? The screening questions are there. What is the get up and go test? Well, here's the get up and go test. This one's the time to get up and go test, um, which was published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. But I picked this picture because it had a nice graphic and it had nice instructions here for you. The time to get up and go test really is used in research, but more often than not, just in clinical work in the clinical world, when you're seeing patients, we use just what's called the get up and go test. So this is asking somebody to rise from a hardback chair with or without armrests to um, I like to use a chair that does have armrests. So walk 10 feet, turn around, return to the chair and sit back down. Um, I recognize that I'm using feet and not meters and I'm an American and don't know the metric system as well as you guys do. Um, but so this, what you're assessing here, then you can get a ton of useful information about lower extremity strength, cerebellar function, about gait, looking for an intelligent gait, a painful gait, how somebody turns when they walk, um, arm swing and cadence, and do are they sitting in the chair and they're having to use their arms to get up? Well, then that may be proximal muscle weakness or have, are they having to not able to get up? They may, that may indicate weakness um, in their quadriceps that you can then address. So the get up and go test is, is a great tool. It can tell you lots and lots of information in a very short uh, period of time. And if folks aren't able to do this, that's a high indicator that they're at risk for falling. And then you need to do more digging to make sure that you can mitigate um, that person's fall risk. So the next thing we want to think about with Mr. Caldwell is depression and the screening questions there are do you often feel sad and depressed or have you lost pleasure in doing things over the past few months and again if these are answered in the affirmative you can either choose to do the PHQ-9 or the geriatric depression scale both of which are validated tests. So here's the geriatric depression scale. Um, again, it's a validated test. Um, it consists of 15 questions that are ridiculously hard to answer yes or no to. These are yes or no questions. You can see there the first question is, are you basically satisfied with your life? Yes or no, um, and so on and so forth. These questions often make us feel uncomfortable when we ask them ourselves because they're difficult to answer. When you do this with a patient, the way that I introduce this is I'm concerned about your mood, I'd like to ask you some yes or no questions that are really hard to answer yes or no to, and then go through the questions. So are you basically satisfied with your life? Yes or no. And so very often people will want to tell you why they're answering one way or the other. But in order to get through this test, you need to make sure that you say, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say, and I want to address it in just a few minutes but answer either yes or no. Don't assume um, what their answer is based on what they're telling you. They need to tell you either yes or no, so on and so forth down to the end. Once you finish this, you score it in the score of greater than five affirmative responses. Um, 
or yes or no responses, which are listed here in the answers column, um, suggests depression, then you can go back and say, you know, I see here that you've told me that you're not satisfied with your life. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And then allow your patient to tell you about that. Now this takes time, right? And as I've mentioned a couple of times, you don't have to do all of these screening questions the first time you see someone, but you do have to do them all eventually over a series of visits with the patient. When you see somebody, you try to address like what their most critical safety issue might be and do those screening questions first. This is the PHQ-9, the Patient Health Questionnaire 9. And again, I told you it has nine questions. The instructions here are over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? This is a patient questionnaire, so you can hand this to a patient and have them fill it out. The answer choices are over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? And they can answer not at all, several days, more than half the days or nearly every day. And again, you can see the anchors here of the questions. Then you add up the columns and total it up. And you here you have what the scores mean. So a score of five to nine is minimal symptoms. And it tells you what some treatment recommendations might be. 10 to 14 is minor depression or dysthymia or mild ma major depression. 15 to 19 is major depression and they're moderately severe. And then greater the than 20 is definitely major depression. So then here are some treatment rec recommendations for the patient. Now, if you don't wanna hand this to a person, it's okay. You can ask them these questions as well and then score the test. Again, though, this is a validated test. And as with all validated tests, you have to ask the questions exactly as they're written. You cannot vary from that or make them up or ask nine before one. Um, you need to ask them in the order um, that they're given. Now, all of these tests that I've shown you so far are free and in the public domain and are available if you just do a quick Google search um, for them. So lastly, then, we're worried about Mr. Uh, Caldwell's cognitive uh, status. So we would perform the mini cog, and then if we fail the mini cog, then we would do another standard test, like assessment test, like the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the SLUMS, which I'll show you. So this is the mini cog. Um, again, this was published in 2000 in the Inter uh, International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. This is an attempt um, to, because we're always looking for something faster and quicker, to do a, a quick test to look for, screen for whether or not somebody has, uh, has dementia. So the way that you administer this test is you ask somebody to listen carefully to you and to remember three unrelated words. Um, I like to use the words apple, table, and penny. Those are three simple words. They're two syllable words. You shouldn't pick words that are more than two syllables. Then you ask the person to repeat them back to you. Why do you do that? It's because you want to make sure that they've heard what you've said. So they repeat it back to you. And then you ask them, you give them a piece of, you tell them, please remember the following three words, apple, table, penny. And then you give them a piece of paper and you ask them to draw a clock. You say, please draw a clock in the hours of a clock as they normally appear. Place the hands of the clock to represent the time 20 minutes after 11 o'clock. Why 20 minutes after 11 o'clock and not 1120? Because it's more complex to ask somebody to draw a clock with the time 20 minutes after 11 o'clock. Now, why did they pick that time? Well, they picked that time because if you think of a standard clock and you divide it in half, there are two quadrants. And so these hands would go into two different quadrants on the clock. You can really tell if somebody has a field cut in their vision or different issues with their vision, depending upon how they're putting the numbers around the clock. So the clock drawing is considered a distractor, and after they do that, then you ask the patient to repeat the words that you previously gave to them. And the way that you score it is you give one point for each of the recalled words, and the clock draw is either a positive or a negative. There's no partial credit here. You either get it right or you don't, because giving somebody partial credit, while it may make us feel good, um, doesn't do the patient a service. So it's either right or it's wrong. In the way a score of zero indicates a positive screen for dementia, a score of one or two with an abnormal clock draw indicates a positive screen for dementia. A score of one or two with a normal clock draw indicates a negative screen for dementia, although I would tell you that I would still go on and do an assessment tool there um, because they have some issues with short-term memory recall. And a score of three indicates a negative screen for dementia. 
So this is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment that I've been talking about for a while now. You can see here the website, www.mocatest.org. This test is scored out of 30 points um, and again, is available free and in the public domain. It comes with instructions on how to give this test. So you should absolutely read those instructions before giving this test so that you're doing it right and in the validated way. It's available, like I said, in 55 different languages. Um, there are three versions of the English test. You want to give this test to the person in their native language, um, the first language that they've spoken, if at all possible. So the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the MOCA, consists of several different domains. So visual, spatial, and executive functioning includes a trail making test, drawing a cube, and then here comes that clock again. Um, several times I've been asked, well, if you do the mini cog um, and they've drawn a clock, do you have to repeat the clock here? And I would say, no, you don't. If you've done the, the test on the same day, um, you can use the same clock. But if you do the mini cog one day and then bring the patient back for this test, you have to repeat the clock. Then this right here is the naming section. This is a lion, a rhino, and a camel. The reason I bring that up is because so often students tell me that this is a hippo and it's not. This is a rhino, they're the horns. Memory is another one of the sections um, where you ask the patient to repeat these five words, face, velvet, church, daisy, and red. You give them two opportunities to register those words. And then you do some distraction with attention. So you read a list of digits asking them to respond to these digits forward or to tell you these digits forward after they hear them and then tell you these digits backwards. Another attention test is to read out a list of letters and ask them in this particular test to tap their hand every time they hear the letter A and then serial subtraction starting at 100. Language then is the next domain on this test, asking people to repeat sentences and then asking them for fluency. So on this particular test, asking them to name the maximum number of words in one minute that begin with the letter F. Abstraction is asking people to tell you the differences between things. Um, there's a concrete abstraction, so a train and a bicycle, how are they similar? A concrete abstraction may be that they both have wheels. A more Higher level abstraction is that they are methods of transportation. And then how are watch and ruler similar? Um, delayed recall. So we did all of this as a distraction and then we get to delayed recall looking for short-term memory recall. And we asked them, what were those five words that we asked you to remember? If they're able to remember all five, fantastic. If you, and they get five points. If they're able to, if they don't remember these words, then you can either give them a category cue, and the categories are listed in the instructions for the MOCA, or a multiple choice cue, and again, those multiple choice cues are in the instructions for the MOCA. They don't get any points for doing that. It just tells you, gives you some more information. Like if somebody is struggling with memory, you can tell their family, you know, if you give them a couple of categories, they'll be able to remember it, and maybe less uh, anxious about not being able to remember. And then here at the bottom, orientation questions. So what is the date, month, year, day, place, and city? And again, this is scored out of 30 points. Now the number means something. Um, here they'll tell you if it's greater than 26 that that's considered a normal test. But I would like to argue that if somebody scores a 20, 26, but five of the points that they miss are here in memory, that I'm still worried about that person. So it's a number based in context. This is the SLUMS. The SLUMS is the St. Louis University uh, Mental Status Exam. It was developed at the Veterans Administration Hospital in St. Louis, and you can see this one here. From a global perspective, the MOCA is probably the mo more applicable test, um, and it is the gold standard, so I'll let you review this um, on your own. Again, the domains are very similar, and again, it's scored out of 30 points, but remember that it's a score within context. This is the Mini Mental State Exam. It's here, again, for completeness sake, but we don't use this test anymore because it's proprietary. So if we think about Mr. Caldwell's management plan, if we've gone through this entire screening and assessment, what we found then in his medical domain is that he has poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension because he hasn't been taking his medications as prescribed. He has gastric irritation due to NSAID use for his arthritis. In his functional domain, we found out that he has impaired IADLs. He needs assistance with finances, shopping, and cooking, and he's a fall risk. In his psychosocial domain, we find out that he has symptoms of depression and mild cognitive impairment. So how are we gonna deal with these things? 
in the United States, and I'm certainly certain there, you can develop a strategy for your patient to remember to take their medicines. Here we would use a, what we call a pill minder or a pill box. That, that's those plastic containers where they have the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday labels on them. And do pill counts, have him rem, um, with reminders. Uh, for gastric irritation, we would stop the NSAID. NSAIDs aren't great drugs for older people. Um, use non-pharmacologic and topical treatment. So there's something called Voltaren gel here in the United States, um, which is uh, a, a compounded uh, ointment that can help with pain or acetaminophen. For functional um, fu impairment, for his IADLs, the things that we can do are to help find him assistance with his finances and shopping and have prepared meals delivered to him. Here in the United States, we have a service called Meals on Wheels, which is a lovely service that provides meals to patients in their homes. For fall risk, we'll get him some physical therapy and do an exercise program with him. For symptoms of depression, consider a social daycare program and an antidepressant if he's amenable for that. And for his mild cognitive impairment, we'll follow this. If we're concerned and we're not clear on the diagnosis, we may refer him to a neuropsychologist for further evaluation. So in summary then, geriatric assessment is critical. I hope that I've made that point to you. Um, it's critical because we want to make sure that we maximize the health, quality of life, safety, and function of our patients. It helps to complement the typical history and physical exam, really giving you an efficient framework um, to ask these questions so that we won't miss things. It consists of standard screening questions that may, if answered in a positive way, uh, trigger the use of standard geriatric assessment tools and other interventions, as we mentioned. So it's been lovely to talk to you today. I was so honored to speak with you. And I know that um, our internet connection dropped, but if you've got uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, you can uh, forward those through Dr. Barija and his team. Um, and again, um, it's been just my honor and privilege to speak to you today. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope you have a lovely uh, rest of your Friday. Thank you.